Number 21. A 56-year-old female is found supine in a narrow hallway of her mobile home. She complains of severe weakness and dizziness and states that she is unable to walk. There is no evidence of trauma and the patient, patient states that she did not fall. How should you and your partner move this patient to a more spacious area? So you'd want to move her, if at all possible. In this case, it is. There's no evidence of trauma. So it's okay to move her um, an extra amount. You want to move her to a more spacious area where you can act, like, easily deal with her. If it's a really narrow hallway, you can't get down by your head and check things. There may not be much lighting. So this makes sense. Um, do you all remember what the differences are between some of these carries that you probably haven't looked at in a while? Okay, so the scoop, the scoop stretcher looks sort of like a backboard, um, except it is hinged at the top and it's split open in the middle and it like closes again at the bottom. So if you specifically have a patient that has like a broken pelvis or a broken hip, it would be really, really painful to log roll them onto something um, or lift them up in some other more direct manner. You can actually take this. It takes a lot of room to do and it's kind of awkward. But you can like put it underneath them and it like opens up like a like one of those banana clips that people used to put in their hair in their 80s and closes back around them and then you could like it locks at the bottom and so it literally scoops around them from both sides um, to lift them so that you're not having to roll them it like fits underneath so that wouldn't really make sense here because we don't have a ton of room in this hallway and those take a fair amount of room and also there's no reason to use it there's no evidence that she has broken hip broken pelvis or anything like that um, direct carry what would that be like straight up lifting their body, like holding onto the torso or something. Um, extremity lift would be lifting from the extremities, so holding arms and legs to lift. And emergency move, we're, this would be more of a classification of general moves that like quickly move them out. If this was a lady who was in a car, she'd been in a car accident and the car was on fire, you'd use some sort of emergency or rapid movement to try to get her out. That's not the case here. So... The answer for this one is actually an extremity lift. Uh, based on the narrow space in the hallway, that's probably the one that's going to give you the most uh, ability to control her and yourself. If you lift her by kind of like under the knees and the shoulder area, um, you're lifting her body by those points that can carry a fair amount of weight, that you can support her well, uh, but you're not trying to get all up underneath her body yourself with you and a partner. That would be really difficult. Okay. Number 22, you respond to a local motel for a young female who is sexually assaulted. The patient is conscious but confused. She tells you that the last thing she remembers was drinking beer at a club with her friends the night before. When she awoke, she was in the bed of the motel room. You should be most suspicious that this patient, what? C. C. This one is a little bit more straightforward. Uh, for one thing, you guys have heard, you all, you all know what rohypnol is, right? Rufies, the date rape drug. Okay. Uh, there's others, actually, that would have a similar effect, but that's the one that everybody talks about. It's the most common. So this one's kind of straightforward. It seems to follow, like, a really typical scenario. So, no, acutely intoxicated would be very intoxicated. Oh. Yeah. Um, if a condition is acute, it means that it's um, a big deal, basically. Um, if it's acute onset, it means it's sudden. So there's kind of slightly different meanings to that word. But... <laughs> Good point, but no, acutely intoxicated would mean substantially intoxicated, and that wouldn't make sense here because um, she's conscious but confused, so like, I mean, I guess you could say that maybe she's kind of coming out of it, but she doesn't have any other signs of um, maybe a hangover or something like that, and she says she was drinking beer versus something else that might be stronger and lead her towards a, a higher state of drunkenness. You can get drunk off beer, but it's just... You know, if she said she was drinking, like, straight vodka, I might think something different uh, in this case. Number 23, a man finds his 59-year-old wife unconscious on the couch. He states that she takes medications for type 2 diabetes. He further tells you that his wife has been ill recently and has not eaten for the past 24 hours. Your assessment reveals that the patient is responsive to painful stimuli only. What should you do? So... This is one of those questions where you want to look at your patient assessment chart. Uh, we, we, you know, BSI, is the scene safe? All of those things there. And then when you actually look at your patient, you're talking level of consciousness, general impression, ABCs. Um, and then you go on from there. That's kind of the model you want to follow here. So if you all remember last time what I said about if it's a scenario question and they're asking what should you do first and oxygen is on the list, 
Oxygen is usually the correct answer, okay? Um, based on that, you'd be looking at B and C. So we have 100% oxygen via a non-rebreathing mask, or we have open and maintain airway and assess breathing. Which one would you do first? C. C, yeah. It's not that the other one is wrong. It's not that any of these are wrong. It's just the very first thing you should do. It doesn't, it's not always going to say the first thing you should do. It's not going to have that clear of wording. But if it's just saying what should you do or something like that in a really general sense, it's meaning what should you do first. And the answer in this case is C because airway breathing is like right up there, one of the first things you handle. Number 24. A patient with a persistent cough informs an EMTB that he has tested positive for HIV. On the basis of this information, the EMTB refuses to treat the patient. Which of the following statements best describes this situation? So is it um, permissible for, you know, pick a reason, is it permissible to not treat a patient, to refuse to treat a patient? Generally speaking, no. Um, if they've tested positive for HIV, there are, you know, we have all those BSI precautions because, like, the whole point of what we do is putting ourselves in a situation where we're getting right up close to somebody else's sickness. Um, that's why we have BSI, you know, gloves and everything else that's included in that to protect yourself. It's not to protect the patient. Um, so that being said, refusing to treat them just because they have a particular illness is actually ethically unacceptable. Um, if you were confused about this, if, if it's a question that you just don't know the answer to, which is fine, you're going to run across questions that you don't know the answer to, uh, one way to kind of help you figure out what the answer should be is looking at the choices, and A, B, and D are all essentially saying the same thing. Um, medically prudent, I mean, y'all know what prudent is, basically meaning that it's the right thing to do. Um, if it's a prudent choice, it is a careful, correct choice. So that's not all that far off from saying something is reasonable and justifiable or legally acceptable. They're all kind of kind of saying the same thing, like, good job. The only one that's saying something different would be ethically unacceptable, um, and that's maybe a clue that the one answer that is, like, so far off from the others, it, that isn't saying essentially the same thing as the others, is probably the correct one. Number 25. A patient partially regains consciousness in route from his office to the emergency department. Although somewhat confused, the patient tells you that he feels fine and does not want to go to the hospital. Under these circumstances, what should you do? Okay, so talking about refusals for patients. Do patients have the right to refuse treatment or transport? Mm -hmm. Okay, under what conditions? Okay, so that has to be expressed, meaning they have to sign the document. They have to very clearly say, no, I don't, and I'm willing to sign my name to it. Um, occasionally you'll have a patient who won't even sign the refusal document and that gets kind of weird because then you have to have witnesses signing another document saying that he wouldn't sign the original document. Um, but that, that happens. Essentially they have to very definitely expressly refuse, just like you'd have to expressly give consent. Um, the refusal also is supposed to be an informed refusal. Just like it has to be informed consent, you're supposed to tell all the risks, advantages, disadvantages, benefits, all that stuff for consent. If somebody refuses treatment, you have to do the same thing for them there as well. You want to tell them the risks of what they're planning on doing. Don't just kind of assume they know it because maybe they don't realize what the situation is um, and that you really truly believe, like, from all of your training and all of your knowledge that they need a particular treatment. So if they're going to refuse it, they have to be informed about the, the ramifications and they have to expressly give that refusal, just like they'd have to expressly give consent. Um, however, just like not every patient can give consent, not every patient can refuse. Um, again, the, the, the conditions are the same. If somebody can legally give consent, they can legally refuse to give consent. If they cannot legally give consent, they cannot legally refuse to give consent. So in this case, can this guy legally refuse to give consent? Why not? Yes, partially regains consciousness and he is somewhat confused. Okay, both of those things point to the idea that this patient is not necessarily mentally competent at that moment to make a prudent decision. Um, we would put them in the classification of somebody who still has like consciousness problems. They can't consent to anything, they can't not consent to anything. And so at this point it becomes a question of doing what you believe to be the most correct choice at this time based on your standard of care um, and your scope of practice. 
So, having said all of that, do you have any idea which one of these is the answer? The answer is D. Yes, you want to assess whether or not the patient's mental condition is impaired. That will for sure tell you whether or not they can consent or refuse, in this case, to go to the hospital. Um, you would not want to have the patient sign a refusal form and return to his office without making this particular assessment. Number 26. An unrestrained patient is sitting in his car after an automobile crash. He is conscious and alert, has no visible trauma, and is complaining of neck and back pain. Before removing him from his car, what should you do? And you guys should know this because it's what you guys did when we practiced. The answer would be B. Yeah, so you're good. It would be between B and C. We're talking about that whole idea of cervical collar immobilization. Um, in this case, remember that vest-style device we talk about, the KED. Um, that's what it means. If it ever says a vest-style device, it means the KED thing that you wrap around somebody. And that's what you would do in this case. 27. You respond to the scene of a motor vehicle collision. Upon arrival, you find a young female sitting on the curb. Other than a small abrasion to her forehead, she does not appear to be seriously injured. As you are performing your initial assessment on the patient, a police officer advises you that her husband, the driver of the vehicle, was killed in the accident. What is your most appropriate next action? Okay. So, you have a patient. Um, what do we know about this patient? She was in a car wreck. She was in a car wreck, yes. Okay, so she was in a car accident, presumably sitting next to her husband. Her husband was killed. We don't know which one was driving. It's not important. If her husband, oh, it, it, sorry, we do know. Her husband was the driver. If her husband, the driver, was killed, is it likely that all she has is a small scratch in the forehead? No. All we know is that she does not appear, in quotes, to be seriously injured. We don't actually know if there's anything else going on because we're just starting to assess her. We haven't actually fully checked, so it doesn't tell us anything about airway breathing circulation, um, we don't know if she has a head fracture, we don't know anything like that. Uh, but we do know that her husband was killed, so there was obviously a significant enough mechanism of injury involved here. Um, it was not a small amount of force if it killed her husband. So we should suspect that there's probably something going on with her. That being said, how would you deal with any patient that you haven't yet assessed but you suspect has a high likelihood of injury? Say what? Okay, A or C, good. That's a good cut down. So you wouldn't want to do B because getting their vital signs is so far down on the list and you don't ever ask a patient if they want to be transported before you know what's wrong with them. Like, at that, when it's time to transport them, then you will tell them, ma'am, we believe we need to transport you for X, Y, and Z reasons. So B is out. D is out because that focus exam on the patient with emphasis on her forehead, like, again, that's assuming that that's the only thing wrong and you can't make that assumption yet. Um... A is complete the initial assessment, and you'll see it listed a couple ways. When it says initial assessment, that's talking about ABCs. And when it says the rapid trauma assessment, that's talking about looking for life-threatening conditions, uh, both of which are involved in that very first section when you're talking about checking circulation, checking for major signs of bleeding, checking for level of consciousness. It's all bundled up in there. Um, C, fully mobilize the patient's spine and transport. The answer in this case is A, because C is slightly farther down on the list. So C is taking action that you don't yet know whether or not you need. Um, a is doing that assessment that you haven't yet done. Again, it's higher up on the list. You may have to immobilize their spine. You may have to transport them. It is actually possible that all she has is a small abrasion on her forehead. But we don't know because we haven't assessed, so we have to assess. So the answer is A. 28. Sorry, did you have a question? Um, I would immobilize her head first. I would have somebody hold manual C-spine stabilization, and I would go ahead and put a cervical collar on. Um, and I would probably, like I'd have my partner do that while I did the initial assessment, or I would do that quickly before the initial assessment. Because if you look back at the patient assessment chart, you've got your BSI, you've got your scene size up, and in the scene size up um, is included whether or not you need to do C-spine precautions, like spinal compromise, you're not sure. So that spine stuff happens up at the top, but you don't have to do that full immobilization of the patient's spine yet. You care about the cervical vertebrae um, not moving around because that's where if there's some sort of problem up here in the neck and you allow that to get worse, that's where they can actually become paralyzed and die from. 
Um, so you want to get that taken care of right away. That's one of those possible life-threatening injuries. And then you do the rest of your ABCs, look for other life-threatening injuries, and then eventually down the line you would make sure to fully immobilize them in transport if that was the case. So it, it's, it's not a bad thing to do at all, but you don't do it quite in that order. Did I answer your question? Okay. Number 28. A 37-year-old female with a history of diabetes presents with excessive urination and weakness of two days' duration. You apply 100% oxygen and assess, assess her blood glucose level, which reads 320 mil, uh, milligrams per deciliter. If this patient's condition is not promptly treated, she will most likely develop what? What is severe insulin shock? So severe insulin shock is when you have relatively too much insulin in your system, not enough glucose. That's when your numbers are going to get really low. That's hypoglycemia. So that would be no. Yes, correct. Um, what is acidosis? You'll sometimes see it written as acidosis, ketoacidosis, or the full term diabetic ketoacidosis, or DKA, um, listed multiple ways. What is that? Okay, that's, that's not bad. That's going into the physiology, but essentially that's correct. Um, it's when you have too much blood glucose. And so your body is starting to break down. Um, it, it's, it's just not processing things properly. And, um, yeah, you do end up having too high of an acid content. But, yes, you're correct. Um, but what you need to remember about it for this sake is hyperglycemia. So you've got... Insulin shock, which is hypoglycemia. You've got DKA, which is sometimes also called a sugar coma. Like, we talk about that in terms of, oh, I've got a sugar coma, I ate too much. But realistically, like, that's also a term we use to describe hyperglycemia. Um, and then dehydration, you all know what that is. Not having enough fluid in the body. What is complete renal failure um, refer to? When we say renal failure, what organs are we talking about? Kidneys. Kidneys. Okay, so complete renal failure would be kidney failure. Is there any indication that there's a kidney issue here? No. With the exception of, okay, urination comes from the kidneys, so, like, you know, something could tie in there, but we don't know anything about blood from the kidneys. Um, and, in fact, excessive urination wouldn't be likely if there was kidney failure. They probably wouldn't be processing and uh, producing any urine at all. So that doesn't make sense. Um, and then hypoxia and overhydration. We don't know anything about her oxygen state because hypoxia is low oxygen. And overhydration wouldn't really make as much sense as dehydration. Why? Yeah, because of that excessive urination. She's weak. Those would be really... Um, dang it. I don't know why this thing keeps messing up. Those would be signs of um, dehydration. So in this case, the answer is B, acidosis and dehydration. Number 29, you are assessing a conscious 55-year-old male with a sudden change in behavior. Which of the following clinical findings would be most suggestive of dysfunction of this patient's central nervous system? B. So the answer to this one is actually B. Good job, Alexis. Um, rapid, eye move, rapid eye movement would be the most suggestive of dysfunction in the patient's CNS. Exactly. The, the thing here is none of the others really make sense. A regular pulse, remember the pulse is regulated by the heart itself. It's got that property of automaticity. So you're not going to expect CNS to necessarily be affecting the way the heart's beating. That's why somebody can still have a heartbeat even after they're brain dead because um, they do operate differently. Uh, excessive tearing or crying and consistent eye contact, those, I mean, I don't know. If somebody's excessively crying or if they're, like, staring you down, those are weird, but I wouldn't think signs of CNS problems. Um, rapid eye movement, though, would be something that could be like caused definitely by some neurons not working properly, triggering off too much or not enough, and their eyes are kind of shifting all over, and they're not controlling it well. So yes, the answer to this one is B. One more, and we'll take a break. 30. You have just delivered a full-term infant. His respirations are rapid and irregular, and he has a strong cry. What should you do next? Yes, the answer is C. Good job. Y'all are getting better at reading into these questions. Just because we know about their respirations, remember, we still got to do their circulation. 
um, and so we would want to take their pulse. Don't need a BVM, don't need oxygen because um, we ha he has good respirations, strong cries, so that's fine. You will want to allow the mother to hold her baby, and you will want to clamp and cut the umbilical cord. But when we talk about what to do next, we mean like immediately next thing to do, and that is take a pulse. Number 31. You are summoned to a convalescent center for an 88-year-old female with an altered mental status. A staff nurse advises you that the patient has terminal cancer and that her physician stated that she would probably die within the next few hours. A valid do not resuscitate order is presented to you. When caring for this patient, what should you do? D. Make her, comfort make her comfortable and provide emotional support. Um, you don't straight up depart the scene. I mean, a DNR just means no extraordinary measures to resuscitate, which can include CPR. It doesn't mean no treatment ever. So um, you've been called in because of that altered mental status, not because she has cancer and may die soon. You're still there to check on the altered mental status, um, do whatever you can to properly care for this patient. Remember, we do care for emotional needs as well as physical needs. So definitely not A or C, um, but also not B, because we aren't supposed to do CPR. She has that DNR order. A 20-year-old male was pulled from cold water by his friends. The length of his submersion is not known and was not witnessed. He performed an initial assessment and determined that the patient is apneic and has a slow, weak pulse. What should you do? Okay, so there is a lot of information in this question, um, or in these answers specifically. Things that we know that we should do. Oxygen, okay, for sure. So if any of these didn't have oxygen in there, they'd be wrong. What else should we do? Keep him warm. Yes, you do want to warm him up. Remember, you want to warm somebody up um, who is in this particular scenario, who's been very, very cold. You want to warm them up carefully, because what can happen if you warm them up too fast? Go into shock. Um, they can actually go into a ventricular fibrillation. It can um, cause damage to their heart and cause a heart attack if it goes too quickly. So you do want to be very, very careful when you're raising up their body temperature. Um, how, what is the easiest way to raise their body temperature? Okay, even easier than that. I can't hear y'all if you're talking. Even easier than that. Take off their wet clothing. Like the wet clothing that was in the cold water with them is holding a ton of cold right next to their skin. It's taking away all of their heat. The quickest way is to get them warm and dry, just like you do with babies. So take off that wet clothing, keep them warm, give them a blanket, crank up the, um, the heater in your ambulance. Don't keep it as cool as you normally would. Um, okay. This patient, knowing the things that we know, what can we automatically say is wrong? A? Why A? Yeah, we don't know anything that suction is necessary here. What about the other answer choices? What else is absolutely wrong? D, because your patient is apneic. So they don't just need oxygen, they need ventilatory assistance. Rescue breaths, BVM, something. Um, a non-rebreather is not going to do it. So between B and C, what is the better option? The answer is C. Remember we talked about you want to be careful with how you um, raise their temperature. You want to be careful with them in general. Transporting carefully is key. Uh, rescue breathing, remember that's specifically, like BM isn't bad, but rescue breathing is specifically pertaining to what we're talking about here in this particular scenario. Removing their wet clothing, immobilizing their spine, not just the C collar. Like that's part of it, but it's not the whole thing. You want to completely immobilize their spine. 33. Upon arriving at the scene of a patient with difficulty breathing, you determine that the scene is safe. You enter the residence and find the patient sitting in a chair in obvious distress. Your first action should be to... D. Introduce yourself to the patient. Yes. All these other things are things you're going to have to do, but like literally the first thing you do before you start asking them what's going on or poking and prodding at them is say, Hi, my name is blank, and I'm here to help you. Number 34. 
While examining a woman in labor, you see the umbilical cord protruding from the vagina. What should you do? We talked about this um, just the last time we met. B, push the infant's head away from the cord. Remember, we said this is one of the only times that you'll ever actually put your fingers inside um, in order to appropriately lift the baby's head or buttocks or whatever might be causing pressure on that. Um, so you'd want to push that away from the cord. You wouldn't ever want to tug on the cord or do anything to that. Certainly wouldn't want to push it back inside um, at ever. <laughs> Number 35. A 59-year-old male presents with a sudden onset of severe lower back pain. He is conscious and alert, but very restless and diaphoretic. Your assessment reveals a pulsating mass to the left of his umbilicus. What should you do? When we're talking about a pulsating mass to the left of his umbilicus, what's the umbilicus? Belly, Belly button, navel. So pulsating mass to the left of that. What do we think that probably is? The, um, the appendix is on the lower right-hand side. So this almost guaranteed um, is very specifically an abdominal aorta. When they talk about, I mean, in real life it can be more difficult to determine, but for sure on the test it's going to mean an abdominal aorta. So, or excuse me, an abdominal aortic aneurysm. Sorry, I didn't finish the whole thing. So your abdominal aorta, which is the descending part of the aorta that comes from the heart, goes down, it's like right to the left of the spine, um, usually, sometimes people are flip-flopped. And, um, and if it has an aneurysm, remember that's when the walls of the blood vessel are, th are weakening and, and thinning out, and so the blood vessel itself is sort of like bulging like a balloon at that particular location. Um, and so because of that, because the aorta carries so much blood directly from the heart, it has its own pulse. Um, it's very distinctive. And if there's an aneurysm, you can see that pulse. Even from where its position is kind of implanted in the, or towards the backside, you can see it from the front of the abdomen. Uh, it's very distinctive because it'll be pulsing along with the patient's pulse. So in this case, what should we do? We're going to go for B. Remember, if oxygen is an answer choice, odds are it is the correct answer choice. Um, you want to give them oxygen, you want to prepare for immediate transport. You would not want to vigorously palpate the abdomen. Um, they're already in pain. You've got that pulsating mass. You don't really want to poke at it just on the off chance that that makes it worse. I say off chance, but that's a very good likelihood that it could make it worse if you're vigorously poking at it um, to see what's going on. You don't want to put him in a sitting position. Um, that's not going to be comfortable given the type of pain he's got and what's happening. Um, and you do want him to be on his back because it's going to be easier to treat. And requesting a paramedic unit to give the patient pain medication is sort of avoiding the problem. Like you're treating the lower back pain and completely avoiding the fact that if this thing ruptures, the guy's dead in like two seconds. So you need to get him to the hospital as quickly as possible. Number 36. While en route to a call for a patient with chest pain, you encounter a bridge that is covered with fast moving water and is not barricaded off. What should you do? C, yes. You want to let them know that you're delayed and take an alternate route to the scene. Um, in A, I mean, you're not out of service. It's possible that the dispatcher would activate another unit if you were just so far away that somebody else would get there quicker at that point. But you're not out of service. You're just delayed. You let them know what's happening, and then they may tell you to change somehow what you're doing. They're definitely not in charge of putting in barricades, and you're certainly not in charge of using your own ambulance as a barricade um, to prevent people from crossing the bridge. When a warm hand is immersed in water that is 70 degrees Fahrenheit, heat is transferred from the hand to the water through a process called conduction, which is B. Remember, radiation is like what we get from the sun. Um... Convection is like heat carried by moving air, like what you have in a convection oven. And ev evaporation is the heat that we lose through sweating um, as it's taken away by like the water on our skin evaporating and taking it out into the air. Number 38. You have just delivered a baby boy. His body is pink, but his hands and feet are blue. His heart rate is approximately 110 beats per minute, and his respirations are rapid and irregular. 
He has a weak cry when stimulated and resists attempts to straighten his legs. What is his APGAR score? Okay, so let's talk about this. Yeah, I know. Um, let's get a let me get a whiteboard thing going so we can draw and figure out what's happening. Okay, so APGAR. There are five categories. Each of those categories is worth two points. Let me see what I can draw on here. I'm working on it, guys. Okay, so we've got zero, one, and two points. Okay, not too bad. So, yeah, that looks worse up there than it does on my screen. Um, what is the first A for? Appearance. So we're talking about um, the skin condition color-wise, specifically. Um, if it's zero points, what, what's going on with this person or this kid? They're, they're blue. So you're going to see cyanosis. I don't even think I can write. This is going to be awkward. I'm trying to practice doing it this way. Blue. Okay. <laughs> Not terrible. Uh, one point for appearance. So, yeah, exactly. The cyanosis of the extremities or the furthest bits and pieces, um, but overall mostly pink. Body pink, limbs are blue. So we're just going to do B slash P on this one because that's about all there's room for. And then two points would be what? Pink all over. Okay. P, what is P? Pulse. Okay. Zero points for pulse. No pulse. So, zero. One point for pulse. We actually have a number that we go by. And that number is 100. So, you get one point, if a, or the baby gets one point if their pulse is less than 100. Two points if their pulse is greater than 100. Simple enough. G, what does G stand for? G is grimace, okay? Like the purple thing from uh, McDonald's. Purple monster. Probably before y'all's time. It was totally a thing. Um, there was like a purple monster that kept wanting to steal like hamburgers. His name was Grimace. Yeah. Um, so... Grim this is talking about like when you mess with the baby. So if you're like, you know, tapping its feet or something, if you're somehow stimulating it, what does it do in response to you? Um, zero points would again be no response. Nothing, nothing happening with that kid. One point would be uh, like a facial expression. So they kind of go like, eh, like they don't like it. They're obviously responding to it, but really just with the face. Um... Or they're doing like a weak cry. So something small. Let me actually see if I can erase that. I'll just put weak. This may be a bit more clear. And then two points would be something strong, a strong cry. Um, okay. The second A. No, um, this one is actually like action. I forget what, if that's the word that it actually is responding to, but it's meaning um, some sort of like motor response. So to test this one, you would be um, like pulling on their feet. You know, babies have a reflex that kind of keeps their legs up towards their torso, like keeps their knees up a little bit, um, kind of keeps all their body tucked in. It's just automatic. And a baby that doesn't have a strong response, when you kind of pull gently on their feet, pull their feet down, their legs won't pop back up. That reflex isn't strong for them. Um, so a zero, like zero points would be no response at all. Um, one point would be a weak response, like sort of moving but not really a good strong muscle response. And two points would be a strong response, like they're able to pull their legs back up reflexively, their muscles work. All their, it, It's showing that all their connections neurologically are working and hooking up and they can control their own muscles how they're supposed to. 
So I'm just going to put W and S because I'm running out of room. And then R. R is respirations. We measure that specifically with how much they're crying, uh, whether they're crying. So zero points is no respirations, nothing. Um, one point would be weak respirations, and two points would be specifically actually being able to cry. Again, weak versus strong. So in all of these, I'll just, again, do the W and S shorthand, because you all know what I mean. Um, in all of these, like, nothing at all is zero points. Um, a minimal response or a weaker response is one point, and then being active, responsive um, is two points. So that all being said, what is going on with our kid? What do we know? We have body and pink, but hands and body is pink, but hands and feet are blue. So where where are they there? Okay. One point. Um, heart rate is approximately 110 beats per minute. Okay. His respirations are rapid and irregular. So that would be two. Yeah, that's good strong respirations. He has a weak cry when stimulated. Okay. And resists attempts to straighten his legs. Yeah, so that, that's what I was talking about with the strong thing. When, he, when he's resisting, that means he's, he's straightened out his legs and he's pulling him right back up again. So based on this, what's our math going? Um, what is his APGAR Eight. score? Eight. Good job. And you may actually have questions like that where you have to do that. Give an APGAR score or potentially even give a GCS, Glasgow Coma Scale score. Um, so you need to be able to do that math. It's totally okay to like have to draw it out or something, but you want to be able to... Do that. I remember those. What's that? I don't remember. I think you get scratch paper when you take the test. I'm not positive anymore. Um, I think so. When we have the guy come in that just recently took the test, he was talking about the other, the teacher or whatever, uh, he may remember more clearly than me. Number 39. A 66-year-old male presents with bizarre behavior. His daughter states, oh, this one, sorry, this one's kind of cut off on the, on the slide. His daughter states that he didn't seem to recognize her and was very rude to her. The patient is conscious and has a patent airway and adequate breathing. What should you do? The answer would be B, yes. So bizarre behavior um, according to his daughter. We don't, we don't necessarily know what his behavior is normally. We just see it how it is now. So whenever you have an altered mental status case, you want to try to talk to people around them um, and just ask and make sure, like, in what ways is this different from their everyday normal behavior? Maybe he's always very rude. Like, maybe that's just the thing he does because he's old and crotchety. Um, so you don't just want to assume that that's because he has Alzheimer's or because he had head trauma or... You know, maybe she burnt his food the other day. Like, he just may be the kind of person that reacts. So um, you do want to ask and try to find out as close as possible what their normal levels are, if it's an AMS call. Number 40. You are treating a man with a closed head injury following an assault by a burglar. The patient, who has slurred speech, becomes verbally abusive and tells you to leave him alone. What should you do? The answer would be C. Okay. So he's verbally abusive. He's talking at you. He may be cussing at you. He doesn't like you being there. Um, but he has not yet crossed that line to be physically abusive or verbally threatening. You know, um, he's, he's not yet become an actual danger to you. So you don't need to ask a police officer to intervene yet. I mean, if necessary. That's why C says um, utilize law enforcement if necessary. But you shouldn't go straight to, okay, well, let's get the police to arrest him um, and take him into the hospital so we can start treating him. That's way far beyond what you need to do. Um, at the same time, why can we not allow him to refuse treatment? He has a closed head injury, slurred speech, verbally abusive. There's a high likelihood that he has head trauma. And so we're not just going to assume that he is mentally capable of making that 
consent decision at this point. Um, also, the idea that the injury not being his fault somehow means that like consent laws are different, that doesn't apply. Consent laws are always the same, regardless of how the problem happened. So in this case, you would proceed with treatment, um, utilize law enforcement at the point where you felt threatened or you were actually uh, physically attacked, assaulted in some sort of way. Do you need another break, or should we keep going? Keep going for everyone? Well, okay, we'll go to 50. Number 41, a 66-year-old female with a history of hypertension and diabetes presents with substernal chest pressure of two hours duration. Um, her blood pressure is 140 over 90. Pulse is 100, is 100 beats per minute and irregular. And respirations are 22 breaths per minute with adequate depth. The patient does not have prescribed nitroglycerin, but her husband does. What should you do? First off, which answer is totally wrong? D. D. Yeah, you don't give her nitroglycerin. It's her husband's. She doesn't have a prescription. You cannot give it to her. Absolutely. Okay, A, B, and C are all possibles. Um, yeah, this one's kind of an interesting, sort of hard to, to be sure of answer. Um, what I ended up deciding was A, because, okay, oxygen is important. Um, so, I, you know, if you kind of narrow it down, it's either A or C because of that oxygen thing. And I don't, I don't think it's necessary at this point to put the AED a, on this person. We don't actually have signs of specifically heart problems. Um, I mean, she has chest pressure, so it could totally be a heart attack. But um, at this point, we're not seeing anything that makes me think I'm about to have to drop into CPR. I'm not going to put the AEG pads on her ahead of time if I don't have to. I wonder that focused exam because I don't know, maybe she, we aren't told and you can't make assumptions, but maybe she has trauma to her chest that has caused this pressure. Like you don't know a reason yet because you haven't assessed her. And so when in doubt, I would go for what fits your little chart? Oxygen is real high at the top. Um, examining the situation is pretty darn important, too. You wouldn't necessarily treat for something that you don't know exists yet. That's why. That's why I put A. Number 42. Which of the following most accurately defines an allergic reaction? We actually did this one, didn't we? That one was like the very first question. The answer is A. Y'all remember that. Yeah. Number 43. You respond to a movie theater for a 70-year-old male who is confused. His wife tells you he has type 2 diabetes but refuses to take his pills. Your assessment reveals that the patient is diaphoretic, tachycardic, and tachypnic. What does tachypnic mean? No. Breathing fast. So if apneic is not breathing at all, that P-N-E-I-C um, part of the word is talking about breathing, specifically the P-N-E, like with pneumonia. So tachypnic um, is breathing fast, just like tachycardic is fast heartbeat. Diaphoretic, you all remember? What's diaphoretic? Sweating. sweating. Sweating profusely. Okay. Initial management for this patient should include... B. Remember, when in doubt, the question, choice that has oxygen is probably correct because it is so much higher on the list than most other things, that's probably what you do first. Um, if this question was worded a little bit differently and it said, like, what should you do first? And BSI, like, put on gloves was first or was one of the answer choices, that would be the answer because it is first before anything else, right? Um, sometimes these things are, sometimes the questions are sort of deceptively easy. Like, you start thinking about, okay, how would I treat this person? I've got all kinds of information, what I should do, and that's where you all tend to mess up because you overthink and you think about how you would actually fix somebody, um, where in reality, oxygen, like if it has oxygen, it's like, yes, do oxygen. Number 44. You have delivered an infant with gasping respirations. After suctioning and physical stimulation, there is no improvement. What should you do? Are gasping respirations adequate respirations? No, so you definitely have to do something as far as oxygen is concerned, right? Uh, your two choices are C and D. 
Which one makes more sense if they're just gasping respirations? D, actually. Okay, so ventilatory assistance means, uh, it's one of those words, it means like rescue breaths, BBM, thank you, something like that. Uh, you're breathing for them. So I don't know if y'all have talked a ton, if we've really discussed this idea, the difference between respiration and ventilation. Okay, ventilation is the actual physical act of breathing, right? That's like how much air goes in and out. Um, respiration is the gas exchange inside. So either one of those two process can, processes can be messed up. But when we're looking at it here, the problem here seems to be with the actual ventilation, the gasping respirations. Like there's a clear mechanical problem that's happening. Does that make sense? Okay, so because of that, you'd want to help with the ventilations. Uh, if it was just a respiration problem, you'd want to give them oxygen, like the free flow or, um, you know, non-rebreather is a free, fl free flow oxygen. Ventilatory assistance is a BVM. Everyone got that part? Okay. 45. You are caring for a 35-year-old female with pregnancy-related complications. She is clearly experiencing significant stress and is crying uncontrollably. Your most appropriate action would be to... So the answer in this case is A. Um, remember, you are supposed to treat people medically, but you are also responsible for treating people's emotional health when it becomes part of your you know, concern, when they're your patient. Um, because of that, you would definitely not want to... You wouldn't want to discourage her from expressing her fears um, until a counselor is available. You don't know when there's going to be a counselor available. That's essentially, that's skirting a problem. Like, if your job is to deal with emotional problems when they're in your patient, and you're ignoring it, then you're not doing your job. Um, why would you never want to tell a patient or a patient's family that everything will be all right? Yeah, it necessarily won't be all right. Um, clearly something is going wrong, and maybe the doctors will fix it perfectly, and maybe they won't. And um, all of a sudden, if you told them everything will be all right, now you've lied to your patient. It's hollow. It doesn't really mean anything. It's something that anybody can say. And as a medical professional... We expect you guys to be able to give a whole lot more help to your patients than these kind of these weak little platitudes. So you can actually tell them things that will help calm them down um, in terms of what exactly you're doing, the ways in which you're going to try to help them. You can tell them we are going to do everything we can. We're going to do the very best for you and your baby. Um, that's fine. That's not a lie. You're, you're going to do what you can. But you don't want to somehow mislead them and tell them, everything will be okay, or it'll get better someday, or any of those types of words. They don't mean anything, and they're not helpful for your patient. Not coming from you. And you certainly don't want to restrain her just because she's emotional and won't calm down. Um, you don't restrain people just because they're crying a lot. Um, just like you don't arrest somebody just because he started to call you a bad name. Um, don't jump so far ahead like that. Okay, number 46. Number 46 we're actually going to skip. I mean, we can talk about, but we don't know those medications. I'll just tell you guys the answer for this one is cardiovascular disease. So you're not going to have questions like this on the test where they give you a list of medications and expect you to know um, what those refer to, with the exception of the medications we've talked about in this class, like nitroglycerin, albuterol, things like that. Um, this, you know, we don't, you don't have to know what Plavix is. That's not a term that you've necessarily ever heard before. So the answer for this one would be B. Um, if for some reason you come across a question like this on your test, like I said, you won't. But remember, we have talked about how they occasionally throw in questions that they don't expect you to know the answer to because they're trying to test the limits of your knowledge. Like if you're doing really well on the test, they're going to start throwing things out to you that they think an EMT basic won't know. But they want to see, okay, well, what does this EMT basic know? Let's, let's push farther and see what's kind of... What's being taught nowadays? What are, um, what are people picking up? They, they want to get a good understanding of what the average student looks like and then what the exceptional student looks like because they're testing out questions. So based on the fact that the only thing you know about this person is nausea and generalized weakness and he's elderly, cardiovascular problems are a reasonable thing to suspect. Um, that, I mean, even if I had no clue what any of these medications were, that's what I would choose just because... Okay, nausea comes with a heart attack. Weakness can come with a heart attack, especially when you're elderly. You don't have the same super strong pain reactions necessarily. So um, 
those, those symptoms might look different, and in an elderly male, that totally could be a heart attack. So you might just assume cardiovascular is probably a good shot. High, um, high possibility. Does that make sense? If you come into a question like this. Okay. Okay. Number 47. We just have a few more before we'll take another break. You and your partner enter the residence of an elderly couple, both of whom are found unconscious in their bed. There is no evidence of trauma. As you begin your assessment, you and your partner notice the smell of natural gas in the residence. Which of the following should be your most appropriate action? Okay, so a smell of natural gas means definitely that you want to get out of there quick, right? Um, for that reason, you would not do A. You would not stay to do a rapid assessment uh, before moving the patients. Like you said, there's no evidence of trauma, so you're taking that for what it is. Um, I guess there's a chance there could be something, but we're kind of assuming that as a general term of we don't see that somebody has obviously fallen or hurt themselves. Uh, which makes sense because they're both found unconscious in their bed. So you're not going to suspect spinal injury. Um, I, I mean, you don't know. Maybe they fell the day before and hit their head and it's only happening now. That can happen with head injuries. But that's, that's just too far removed from what you'd reasonably suspect under these conditions, especially with that smell of natural gas. Um, you would not want to request another ambulance to assist with lifting and moving of the patients. That doesn't address at all this idea of, oh, there's a hazard in the house. We've got to get out. Um, it just doesn't address the question. It doesn't really make sense in context. Now, C says, quickly exit the residence and request the fire department to move the patients. So, again, you're requesting somebody else to come in and fix the problem, um, which, mm, you know, if they have the tools, if they have the equipment better than you do, there's times that that totally applies. Obviously, you wouldn't run into a fire. Um, at the same time, if you went in to try to help a patient and discovered that there was a fire in the room with them, for example. I hope you wouldn't leave them there and run out yourself. Like, I hope you would take the patient with you. Because the answer here is D. You want to rapidly remove the patients from their residence. Um, whoop, sorry, it skipped up. Using a blanket or clothes drag is essentially using whatever you've got on you, on them, as quickly as possible. If they're in bed, you quickly grab the sheet off of their bed, like the sheet they're laying on, pull it off of the corners of the mattress, and, and you guys yank. Um, they're both unconscious. You may have to, you know, roll one onto a blanket so you can kind of keep, like, move them separately. Uh, but you do want to get them out of there. You, because that smell of natural gas, you don't know how long they've been in there. You don't want to assume that it'll be okay for them to kind of sit in it for another 10 minutes until the fire department arrives and can take them out with masks and things. If it was an actual danger to you, like I said, if there was something imminent, you shouldn't even go in in the first place. Or, you know... If, if the only possible answer is to get yourself out quickly, remember your, your responsibility is first yourself, then your partner, then your patients. So in this case, we're assuming that you probably can get them out because there's not, you know, a fire that's about to kill you both or something. There's not something that seems like it's actually going to harm you if you take the extra 10 seconds. Okay, 48. In addition to ensuring his or her own safety... The EMTB's responsibility when caring for a patient with a behavioral emergency is what? Yeah, it's pretty, it seems pretty basic. The answer here is definitely A. Diffuse and control the situation and safely transport the patient. Um, B is incorrect, uh, as is D for kind of the same reason. Your job is not to actually diagnose the problem or understand what's causing it. Your job is to stabilize, in, in general, with pre-hospital medicine, your job is to stabilize the patient and get them to definitive care. Sorry, we were disrupted with the bell, but um, talking about this question, your responsibility is to safely transport the patient, not determine what's wrong and provide definitive care. Uh, remember, definitive treatment or definitive care, that's talking about whatever is going to actually fix the problem. When it uses those words, it's talking about like what is really needed here. Definitive care is what they get at a hospital. They pretty much don't ever get it in a pre-hospital setting unless all they needed was oxygen. And realistically, that's just not what happens. Um, so when we talk about definitive treatment, we talk about hospitals, doctors, nurses, whatever, not um, ambulance. Uh, so that was why B and D were wrong. C is wrong because you don't take them straight to a specialized psychiatric facility. They have to be referred there, usually by a judge, 
um, if not by their own doctor, if not both. I mean, it's not something that you get to just decide, this lady's crazy, we're going to take her to Timberlawn. That's not how that works. 49. A 75-year-old male with a history of insulin-dependent diabetes presents with chest pain and a general feeling of weakness. He tells you that he took his insulin today and ate a regular meal approximately two hours ago. You should treat this patient as though he is experiencing... So insulin-dependent diabetes is um, also commonly referred to as diabetes type 1, type 1 diabetes. Um, it is the type of diabetes where your body just doesn't properly produce the insulin that it needs. Uh, type 2 diabetes is the kind where your body is no longer able to use the, the insulin that it produces, essentially. So insulin-dependent means that they have to take insulin shots. Type 2, the non-insulin-dependent kind, they take medications to regulate their blood sugar because their insulin that they have is just not doing a good job of it anymore. So he took his insulin and he ate a regular meal, like a f normal sized meal, that's what that means, about two hours ago. Based on that, do we expect that he's having a um, blood sugar problem? No. Actually, no. Yeah, because even though he has a history of diabetes, that's kind of misleading. There's nothing in what he tells you as far as his sample history to indicate that this has to do with diabetes. He took his insulin, he ate, he's eating normally. Um, he's not talking, he doesn't, he doesn't show signs that he um, didn't take insulin or that he ate too much or ate too little or something like that. He didn't mess it up that way. He did what he was supposed to do. Because of that, we're not going to assume that it has to do with blood sugar, so both A and C would be not as correct in this case. Um, that's not to say he can't be experiencing one of those, but we're not going to treat him as if that's the problem. The answer, therefore, is D, a heart attack. Because if you have a 75-year, if you have a patient in general with chest pain and feeling of weakness, we've talked about this phrase like a high index of suspicion, meaning you should think it's really, really likely there is always a high index of suspicion of cardiac arrest, heart attack, heart problem when you have this chest pain and weakness kind of feeling. Um, it's just so common. You don't. The high index of suspicion does not mean that that's what's happening. It means you want to put that like with a big gold star at the top of your list of possible things that are going wrong. You don't want to just pretend like it's not there or that it's not um, possible because it is very, very possible in those cases. Does that make sense? When, if I ever use that phrase again, you'll know what I mean. High index of suspicion. Okay. 50. You respond to a residence for a child who is having a seizure. Upon arrival at the scene, you enter the residence and find the mother holding her child, a two-year-old male. The child is conscious and crying. According to the mother, the child had been running a high fever and then experienced the seizure that lasted approximately three minutes. What should you do? So this is one of those rare cases where the answer with oxygen does not guarantee the answer. Remember, those with oxygen usually have more to do with the order of things taking place. That's when probably every answer is mostly correct, but it's a question of what should you do first. And in those cases, oxygen is usually the answer. Um, in this case, it's just a question of, like, these are four different treatment options. Um, you wouldn't do all of them just in different orders. It's like you do this one or that one or that one or that one. And so because of that, you have to decide which overall treatment option is the best treatment option. Um, it wouldn't be A because, well, okay, why, why wouldn't it be A? Because they were having a fever. Okay, so they were having a fever. So the wet towels, the wet towels might help cool them down, um, but that's not your main concern in terms of treatment, right, because they had a seizure. That's, that's your main concern. The fever is probably what caused the seizure. Y'all do remember that children, um, in children, the cause, of, the cause of seizure is most commonly high temperature, is having a fever. It's called a febrile seizure. It's fairly common. I don't remember the statistic for how many, like one out of every how many kids get it, but it, it's a relatively high percentage of kids um, get seizures in this way, and it's not a super big deal. Randy, do you remember what the statistic is by any chance? Like one in three kids have one of these type of seizures or something? I don't remember. It's, it's the same as the dentist thing. Nine out of every ten patients experience it. I'm lying. I, I don't know, and obviously neither does he, but it's a higher number than you might expect. It's pretty common. Um, okay, that was, sorry, that was fewer seizures. Um, the answer in this case would be B. 
you want to transport them. You don't want to just tell them, tell the mother to take their child in the following day to their doctor. Um, it's not exactly abandonment, but it's just really not the best way to handle this. You're kind of, again, you're kind of passing the problem off to somebody else. Like, well, she's not seizing now. Like, what, is she supposed to call you again when she is seizing? Like, this is when to deal with the problem. They just had a seizure. Um, take them into the hospital. You do want to reassure the mother because, remember, whenever you've got a child who is sick, you really have two patients. You've got the physical well-being of the child, but you also have the emotional well-being of the parent. And you do want to take that into account when you're dealing with this kind of situation.